Yeah. So I'd like to introduce Whitney. Uh, I've actually I met him a few years ago, so I've known him for a few years now, and we bump into each other at conferences. Uh, and <laughs> I actually did not realize you were at Berkeley as well. So let me start with your introduction. So Whitney earned a PhD from UC Berkeley in 1996. Um, uh, that was actually uh, eight years before I joined Berkeley, so we missed each other there. But there he developed a love for using computational and informatics tools to solve his in-the-lab chemistry challenges. After that, following roles at a number of Bay Area biotech startups as the med chemist who also did computer stuff, Whitney became a full-time chemi-informatics scientist in 2003. A few years later, he took a technical position at then Acceleris, seeing our seeing the industry from a whole new perspective, which is the vendor side. In 2007, he transitioned to a sales role and has since held various regional and strategic positions at Acceleris, IDBS, Model N, and now Collaborative Drug Discovery. His responsibilities have included the sale and implementation of solutions across such highly diverse domains as chem informatics, bioinformatics, GLP, GMP systems, business analytics, drug pricing and revenue management. Whitney routinely engages with biotechs, big pharma, government, academic labs, and everyone in between to help solve their informatics, scientific, and business challenges. So Whitney, welcome and look forward Thank to you. your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Devoto. Thank you. Can everybody see me okay? And can you see my slides okay? Yes. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Okay, well, thanks everyone. I know that um, I know that time is stretched a little bit, so I'll try to I will try to talk quickly and make up a little time as we go. Um, uh, as the talk implies, I have a few different uh, topics to cover today. Um, what um, I want to do is give you a little bit of background on, on collaborative drug discovery. Not so much, you know, sort of your boring corporate background, but how we think about um, our approach to supporting um, the drug discovery industry with the software that and platforms that we provide for data management. And also, I um, want to provide a, a look, an exciting look at our newest platform, BioHarmony, which um, is, is something we've been working very hard on and will be released soon, hopefully April 1st. Um, fingers crossed, everyone. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about our evolving flagship, uh, CDD Vault, which uh, is, is really growing and expanding in new and interesting ways. So just jumping right in, you know, CD has been around for about 16 years now and um, provides cloud-based data management services uh, across the world. As you see on the right-hand graph, um, you know, uh, we've been growing rapidly, especially over the past several years. And, um, you know, now CD Vault is approaching over 70,000 logins per month. So we're serving many, many scientists worldwide in a variety of contexts uh, with critical data management services for the for the ever-expanding drug discovery industry. At CDD, we think there's a better way to support drug discovery than traditional software solutions have provided. You know, the drug discovery field, as we all know, is a little bit complicated. Um, it involves a lot of scientists. It takes a long time. Hopefully, that's actually getting shorter. And um, there's a lot of money involved and a lot of data. And when you hand complex problems to smart people at software companies, what you usually end up with are complicated and expensive solutions. It's just kind of a natural way the, of the system working. But what we try to do at CDD is think about simplifying these problems. So our, our fundamental development concepts revolve around these ideas of easy, secure, and collaborative. And we think that if we can, if we can really focus on these concepts, that we will develop software that saves you time. And in this industry, of course, saving time is equivalent to saving lives um, because of the good work that, that you guys are doing out there in the industry. So, you know, the science of drug discovery is largely driven by data. You know, unlike a physicist um, who might actually spend a little more time sort of coming, coming up with fundamental laws, what we're doing in drug discovery is acquiring a lot of data wrapping our heads around that data and using that to drive decisions and drive hypotheses. So, you know, I'm a recovering chemist, as, as Devano has said, and what, um, but, but our friends in biology, you know, I, I don't know that biologists really, really think about laws. They, they sort of do their own thing. They're kind of the criminals of the drug discovery industry. A kid, just kidding. 
to all of my biology friends out there. Um, the chemists, we chemists were worse, right? We make a bunch of laws and then break them all the time. So, um, you know, regardless in drug discovery, what you end up doing uh, is using that data to drive the hypotheses. And I remember one time I had a, a VP in sales who came over from a um, from an engineering background. So he was selling engineering software and we were out at lunch and uh, we were talking, getting to know each other. I asked him, I said, so how are you finding drug discovery? And he, he looked up and he kind of looked like Michael Scott from the office because he kind of stared off in space for a second. And he goes, I don't understand this business. It's all chaos. Um, so really, it's hard for people who are outside of this industry to understand how we do things because it is so data driven and it is so necessary to understand um, what goes into acquiring that data. The questions that we're facing today is are, are evolve, sorry, are revolve around: Are you capturing enough data to answer tomorrow's questions? Because we are moving so quickly and the science is evolving so rapidly. So you know what I mean by that is, if you think about the experiments that you're setting up, you have your procedures, you have ever increasing complexity of instrumentation, and you have your samples and your results and your raw data, your observations, your analysis and oftentimes a lot of assumptions and and complexity that goes into the analysis and and we take all that and maybe we capture it in a notebook or hopefully an electronic notebook but we take all that information and a lot of times to drive a drug discovery program we reduce it to you know an excel table that we load into a database and the challenge here is that we're really capturing the information that we know we need today maybe we're adding some notes and a lot of times those notes are not really you know, so useful. But the, the thing is that the, the information that we're capturing today doesn't really answer those questions that we're going to be asking tomorrow. So maybe temperature or instrument or color or, you know, what floor the data was acquired on is going to be the most important driver of the decisions we're going to be making next year or, or five years from now. And, and, and that's really important. And it's hard to really wrap our heads around that. Um, it was John Lubbock, who was the father of archaeology, who, one of the fathers of archaeology, who invented terms like neo Neolithic and Paleolithic. He said, he said, what we see depends mainly on what we look for. So it's, you know, with that sort of a, a mindset that we're developing our new technology at CDD so we can provide convenient and capable systems that allow you to acquire more data than what you know you need today so you can answer those questions in the future. John Lubbock, by the way, is not the guy that founded Lubbock, Texas. That's a whole different dude. I had to look that one up. You know, in, in 2020, obviously, we're all dealing with COVID. And I thought this was an interesting example of the importance of data and metadata in, in this case, a clinical context, not a, not a, a preclinical research context. But this was an interesting article from the New York Times back in August where they really did a deep dive, a bit of a scientific investigative report into what the PCR results really meant. And, and part of it was we were getting these PCR results back that were in a very binary form, positive or negative. But there was a lot of context around that data that was not well understood and not really being communicated. And the point of this article was to say, look, here are important values that maybe should be reported with this data. In this case, they focused on cycle threshold. Um, you know, we all know that PCR tests, you are amplifying your DNA or RNA signals with um, by, by cycling through. And there could be a big difference between a signal that's detected at 20 cycles versus a signal that's detected at 40 cycles. And there may be very different public health or clinical decisions that are made based on how, you know, how many cycles are gone through before that signal was detected. And it was surprising in this article how many physicians and public health officials did not fully understand the difference in context of the data that was being provided to them across states and different types of tests and all that. So this article kicked off a lot of controversy, you know, with some people saying, hey, this is not really a thing. Um, you know, there are many different kinds of tests. Trust the scientists who are developing the tests. Um, uh, there's a little name calling here, <laughs> of course, that happens because it's 2020. Um, and then other scientists saying, yes, these are complex tests, but we can't just look at it as a binary result. You know, as this last physician said, simply knowing a yes or no answer is no longer enough. 
And the way I think about it is I think about this problem as a five-year problem. You know, in five years, when folks are doing the forensics on this problem, um, having the complete context of these test results will be important, not just for dis dissecting what happened in 2020, but what happens with the next, um, the next pandemic that hits us. And, um, you know, having as much archaeological information as Sir Lubbock would say uh, will be very useful um, in the future. So, yeah, that's metadata. It's important and we need to capture it. How are we doing that in our end of the industry, in the preclinical end of the industry? Um, well, there are mixed results. There's some really good news. Um, you know, the industry is coming to terms with the concept of a data life cycle. So, Many of you probably have heard of FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. These FAIR principles are very um, topical these days. There are a lot of projects. We're working on a number of projects with, for example, the Pistoia Alliance around FAIR principles. And um, yeah, recognizing that there's a problem is the first step um, in, in getting through it. The great news, gold star here, is that our instruments are producing more data than ever before. And with the cloud-based data systems and the amount of storage capacity, we can capture all the data that's necessary uh, or that's there to capture. So yeah, gold star, we, we have the technology, we can do this. Um, so in the software industry, my end of the building, you know, we're actually getting better at this. So it isn't just about making the software capable of doing it, it's making it so that it's you know, not an impediment to doing it, making it easier to use, making it more, ex making the data more accessible. And again, systems are becoming better at this. Uh, CDD has been in this business trying to implement these principles for a long time, but other, you know, companies in this space are doing the same sorts of things now. So, so, you know, yay team on that. Um, along with the box above, the industry issues uh, come ontologies and data standards. How are, are we making sure we're speaking the same language? How are we making sure that everybody's on the same standard? How, how do we know that we have the structures necessary to uh, describe the data that's being captured? So again, we're doing pretty well. Uh, so the last two boxes are where we kind of need improvement. Uh, no offense to my, to my friends and colleagues in the lab, but you know, there are highly variable standards for how different organizations and, and collect data. Uh, you might have a spotless lab, but with a train wreck for data standards. Uh, and the reverse is sometimes true as well. So I think we can do a better job of educating the industry in general, um, bringing up our younger scientists to say, hey, you know, data is really important to collect. Um, it, is, uh, it was really interesting. I was at a meeting one time uh, with one of our customers and their CRO. And our customer wanted the CRO to, um, you know, have a seed in CDD Vault and put the data into CDD Vault because it was going to improve the data and the fidelity and the whole process. And the guy that was the manager at the CRO said, you know, data entry is, for, is an administrative function. We don't do that. Um, and I thought that was a very disturbing and telling uh, response from that particular CRO. Um, I think a lot of places are getting better about that now. Finally, the regulatory and legal regimes and frameworks that are there, um, you know, they should not be on the bleeding edge of these things. They should be a little bit behind. That's actually important. Um, but um, they could probably get a little closer to what's happening today in the real world. So I think there's probably work to do there. Okay, so um, back to our company, Collaborative Drug Discovery. We really have three platforms now to help manage the data and the metadata around the drug discovery process. The first one is CDD Vault. Again, this is our flagship. It's been around for 15 years, but it's constantly reinventing itself. Um, and what many people remember as sort of a quaint little tool off in the corner is now an enterprise system uh, ready for any of the challenges of the biggest organizations in the world. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing today with CDD Vault and some of the newest technology there. I'll do that at the end of the talk here for just a few minutes. In a minute, I'm gonna introduce BioHarmony. We're very excited about this new platform for uh, semantic, a centralized source for semantic drug data. This is a, this is a data product. And I'll tell you about that here in a second, give you a live demo. And then, um, you know, finally, I'm not gonna talk about 
our third platform here, BioHarmony Annotator. It used to be called BioAssay Express, but this is a way to, to help you develop and uh, populate BioAssay um, information with metadata uh, in a way that is fair and uh, leverages public ontologies. So it can be used in two ways. You can take existing procedures and with some language processing and some Bayesian uh, analysis, you can actually extract out terms and essentially you know, register that previously published assay protocol. Or you can start from the beginning, hand this tool to a biologist in the lab and essentially develop a, an assay registration system. We were going to be talking about our work with one of the Pistoia Alliance projects, the Data Ferry project, at the Pistoia uh, Alliance conference, April 28th to 23rd. We're gonna have a publication and some industry publishing recommendations coming out soon. So, you know, hit up the Pistoia Alliance website and uh, please come see, come to that conference and see those that talk. Uh, okay, real quick, BioHarmony, uh, our new product. We're very excited about this. Uh, going live soon. We're in beta test right now with a few folks, and it's going very well. I'm getting a lot of great feedback. Um, who needs to collect data on known drugs? Probably most people in this room, right? Researchers at the bench, researchers at the bedside, and people in the business side of things. Um, but, but how do you do that, right? How do you get data on known drugs? If you're an individual sitting in a room, you know that there are a few sources of data, clinical trials or PubChem or other places where you may go get information on drugs. You also know that there's a sort of vast constellation of information sources you might access. But the problem is you're gonna go get the information from those sources that you know, and you're gonna do what we all do, uh, which is take the information you have and put it into an Excel file. And Excel files are, you know, outdated, unsecured, soon to be lost. It's a silo of data. And if you're an organization, that's probably happening multiple times in your building or on your campus over and over again. You're building these little mini silos of data that are soon to be lost in the midst of time. So the problem here is that it, it, well, you can actually go hire somebody else to do that, right? So you can pay lots of money to companies who do this sort of thing for you. Sometimes they have some computational approaches, but it's basically the same thing. We have what we think of as a different approach um, to this problem. So first of all, we have, well, two cute little robots. The first system is a semantic search engine that is constantly scouring um, the semantic web for new information on, in this case, known drugs. And in these, this, this, this robot, again, is doing this all the time. So you always have the latest information being fed into the system. The information is, is fed to the BioHarmony organizer and annotation robot. And that system does some natural language processing, it does some annotation, it does some organization, which we'll see in a second. And it brings it out to the human users in a really nice, readable, consumable format, and also in ways that the machines can consume. So if you have an existing or you're developing uh, some sort of automated process for your data mining, um, this, this data can be fed into that process as well. Uh, I have a movie here if we need to resort to it, but let's see if we can do this live. Um, this is the this is the BioHarmony website. It is up and running. It is you know we're currently doing some beta, so on any given day, <laughs> you know may not quite work, but you're welcome to go there and play around a little bit. The purchase process is is kind of shut down right now, so uh, again when we go live we'll let people know. But biometadata.com is the website. You can go look for various drugs by name or by mechanism. You know, I can go find Humira, I can put it in my shopping cart, and from my shopping cart, I can, you know, develop a set, go to my reports, and my reports, then again, these reports are coming through on a daily basis, giving me, um, you know, new information every single day. Um, if, I, if I pop open the Humira page, what you're looking at on the left is a navigable set of, uh, of data elements, um, there's some basic drug information there, you know, the names and numbers and some PDB um, information, Kemble IDs, that sort of thing. 
everything with a nice live link out to it. So you can go to a compound report card uh, at Kemble and go get that information straight away. As we go down, we have target information, you know, helpful, you know, question, question marks to hover over um, to get more information about that. But we have target information. And again, we're linking out to say Uniport, Uniport sources um, and, and other, other pieces of information necessary uh, for you to, to understand uh, what this drug is all about. Um, here, we're gonna go into the clinical information. Before I do, I have um, clinical trial information that's been annotated and uh, expanded a bit. I'm gonna open those up. I look at a few other things here. I, I, you can see the indications, the different phases and the different indications, the mesh terms, ontologies, ICD-10 codes, so again, there's a wealth of information here that's brought, been brought together from a variety of sources, all linked out to primary information if you ever need to go you know, look at it in its raw form. The clinical trial information is, is here's a page refreshing. Clinical trial information is, there we go, uh, live information here, uh, up to date, where you can see, for example, timeline info, um, you can look at study design information, eligibility criteria. It's pulled out the exclusion and inclusion criteria um, for all the different clinical trials. And of course, links back to the primary uh, information, in this case, on clinicaltrials.gov. The other link that I had clicked on was the epidemiology information. So again, this has all been pulled out from primary sources. And you can look at proved indications, mesh terms, ICD-10 codes, again. Um, uh, approved, uh, phase four, phase three, again, you know, uh, uh, laid out for you so you can uh, dig through the data quickly. Going back to my original report, as I look through this, I also see variant information, some commercial information, generics. Um, I have trade name info. I have financial info um, broken down. Um, uh, in graph form, and again, exportable out in table form. And then finally, a couple of really impressive uh, elements is we have uh, trends and safety info here. And in this case, the um, uh, trend info um, is, uh, sorry, the trend info comes from PubMed Central documents, uh, papers, in this case, over 15,000 of them growing daily. Again, this is daily refreshes. And then we have safety info from things like FAIRS, uh, the FAIRS dashboard. Um, so if I look at the trends, what we've done here is we're doing natural language processing and some other analysis on all of these almost 16,000 documents looking for top terms, in this case around disease and syndrome, it could be pharmacological substance uh, searches as well. But we're looking in this case to show the disease and syndrome, you know, the various diseases this is used for, um, publications over time, both in raw terms and as fractions, um, proportions of the overall publication record. Um, and then if I go over to the adverse event window, we're looking at over 500,000 adverse event reports, breaking them down into their top adverse event re uh, reported um, categories. Uh, so for example, looking at injection site pain over baseline for all drugs for injection site pain or fatigue for Humira over um, generally what fatigue is reported for for other types of drugs. So as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of information in a variety of forms, all available through one report, through one, one simple subscription service. So that's, uh, that is BioHarmony. Sorry, I tried to find my presentation again. The first there we go. So BioHarmony, one-stop resource for all of this data, AI ready. It's a new semantic technology using a uh, really interesting secret sauce, web-based ontologies to extract out all that data from numerous sources. The data is holistic, so we're not breaking it down into separate categories. We're giving it to you all at once. The subscription is real time, right? So you're always up to date on the latest clinical trials and indications and adverse events if you're really interested in the safety information. Um, and the pricing is scalable. You can buy single reports or drug sets or access to the whole database. And, you know, we'd love to talk to you more if you have any interest.
So finally, in just a few minutes, I wanted to cover a few new things with CDD Vault. So CDD Vault is, um, uh, is, a, is a system for preclinical research data management. The challenges around research data management are pretty standard, we find. You know, they involve usability of the various tools you have to deal with, resources that you have to expend, managing your resources, uh, managing your research data management, um, collaboration of the data, both internal and external, and the data itself. We have biology and chemistry data, a wide variety of data. You know, like I was talking about in my earlier slides, it all has to come together and you want to collect it all, or at least as much of it as possible, and not just report a simple spreadsheet at the end of it. It's like your closet, right? Uh, it's like an episode of Hoarders. There's all this stuff, but you need to keep it. And how do you keep it organized so that people can access it, right? It's my, my daughter likes to uh, compare it to Marie Kondo on Netflix, right? The benefits of organization are that your things are easy to use and get at, that you can preserve them and keep those things that are important to you, and that you can share those things with the people that you care about. And that's what we think of with CDD Vault. We need it to be easy, we need this, the data to be secure, and we need your data to be collaborative. It's really that simple. If you can keep your house in order, it can be, can be of more use to you. So CDD Vault has the various components you need in order to um, run a drug discovery program, but it can also be uh, accessed via API to the various components if you need to plug it into your broader ecosystem. So for example, you know, chemistry, mixtures, biology, all of these different elements of a drug discovery program can move in and out of CDD Vault. We have a, a, a very easy to use web-based GUI. There's a database layer that manages all this data. And then, you know, you can do these various activities in the database layer, like register, store your data, mine for your data, discover new information. And then there's the API that lets you talk to third-party apps. So if you need to work with a pipeline pilot or a new sample management system like Mosaic, or, you know, you want to do some molecular modeling with Schrodinger or um, work with some a visualization program like Stardrop or Data Warrior, that's what the API does. It's fully documented. It's very, very well developed. So, you know, we can, again, we can either be the center of your universe. Um, I'm going to skip this just in terms of time. But you need to be the center of your universe if you're, say, a garage man, biotech, small startup, um, uh, or an academic lab, uh, or if you're a large global research alliance, um, we can work across, you know, multiple countries and time zones um, because it's a cloud-based system. And, and if you're a big pharma company or a CRO, we can be a component in your larger environment. Either way, it works just fine. So for my last two slides, um, three slides, I guess, um, I wanted to just talk about some of the new things we're doing with CDD Vault. Because what we've done is we've expanded the concept of what CDD Vault can store. You know, CDD has been historically a small molecule screening environment. So you want to register small molecules, you want to keep your assay data, some inventory in ELN, you get some administrative features, that's great. And what people have done over time is they've said, hey, look, I want to register my small molecule reagent inventory in there as well. It's basically the same thing, except instead of you register your, your reagents, you keep your catalog info, uh, you're managing you know, your laboratory reagents, maybe you're keeping safety documentation in there. And over time, we've expanded, so you can search for across two vaults if you have permission. You can you know, bring reagents into your ELN stoichiometry table, all that kind of thing works. What we've done, over the past several months is expand so you can register other types of entities, oligos or cell lines or anything into CD Vault as a different kind of entity, give it unique identifiers, and then be able to work with them in their own context. So for example, if you wanna have a macromolecule discovery vault, you can register those oligos, you can use the assay data management part of CD Vault, the protocols to to keep your construct characterization and QC data. And again, the other systems are just inventory, you know, document, ELN management, that kind of thing. If you want to register cell lines, you know, you're creating now a cell line entity. You're keeping reference and QC data in there, and you're managing your procedures and records in there. And again, the search functionality 
cuts across all of those uh, vaults. So if you have the permissions, you can search for different elements no matter where you're at. And what we're working on now is to be able for administrators to administer these uh, projects and users and access uh, more easily. So you know, just to make it simpler for people to um, plug this into your, again, larger ecosystem and provision it better. So as a final example, here's a case where we're using CDD Vault as a DMP case study workflow engine. So you start off in a small molecule vault with a list of molecules, here are their assays. I wanna submit these to a DMP case study. So what you do is over in a different vault, a DMP case study vault, you have projects that are guiding your workflow. And the things that you're registering are DMP case studies, right? So everything gets a new study ID, a sequential ID as you go through. You'll notice that the, uh, you, like I said, you'll notice that the projects are actually guiding this workflow. So to start the project, we have ELN templates and the ELN templates, you know, have a bunch of metadata associated with them that the scientists will collect. And they have Excel files embedded within them that are just Excel. People can use Excel to manage this. And scientists, requesters would basically enter this information into, uh, hey, could you please test my molecule into this type of an assay? Once the request process is ready, um, the folks doing the ELN studies um, will move these, pro these ELN experiments down that project workflow and execute their workflow. Um, and in doing so, they're going to be able to link together different elements of data so they can pull together their protocols and their runs and populate these, these ELN worksheets um, with the result data, which they can then, you know, these, this is the result in an Excel spreadsheet in this case, back in that same ELN entry, which can then be populated back in the main vault for everybody else to consume. So it's a way of segregating workflows, um, using these different um, entities to control um, uh, the data as it flows through the system. All right, so hopefully I haven't gone too long here. Uh, that's the discussion. Uh, I'll turn it over back to Devon for any questions, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Whitney, for your presentation. And um, there is a question um, from the crowd for you. If they have a project and need a need the vault, how is it done? Like the demo trial and like the production overall? Yeah. So uh, with the vault, uh, it's very easy. So again, complete cloud. You don't have to actually uh, install anything on your system. Uh, reach out to us. Feel free to reach out to me directly and I can connect you with the right uh, person from our team um, and then you um, we'll just do a demo usually it's over zoom you know back uh, pre-covid we'd come in live sometimes but again at least half our work would be zoom um, and then what we do is we could happy to set up if it all looks good happy to set up an evaluation there's no cost there's no you know charge for an evaluation we just essentially give you a little space uh, in our cloud and um, the evaluation process is really the training process so as we go through our support team, we'll have, you know, one, two, three calls with you. They usually last an hour and a half. These are Zoom meetings where we're walking your, your folks through the administration of the system, how to load data in the system, how to, you know, how to, how to build reports, get data out of the system. And, and there's a whole lot of online documentation. There are YouTube videos. And again, the system is very intuitive. So by the time you go through this a couple of times um, in a guided process with our support team, you know, you're able to, to, to be independent. And our support team, there's never any charge for support. Our support team is always available. They're always happy to set up a Zoom meeting. Again, go in person when we're allowed to do that again. And, um, and yeah, just work with you guys directly. So by the end of a 30-day evaluation, you know, most people are ready to sort of pull the trigger and, you know, turn that into a, um, a live instance. And sometimes they'll just take their evaluation instance the data is reasonably clean, you know, a few tweaks here and there, and away they go. Some people will take their evaluation instance, leave that as a test instance, create a new instance, take the lessons they learned from the evaluation, um, and, and build a new instance and go live. So, yeah, it's, it's very, very easy. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, Dr. DeBano, do you have any questions or remarks for Whitney's?
Uh, a quick question, a very technical one with me. Great talk again. Um, it started in 2004 when cloud computing was not that, that big. So yeah. what did you use for cloud storage at that point? Did you have your own internal on-premise storage systems that you then migrated to public cloud? Or, uh? Yeah, great, great question. I always tell people this. So I know our CEO, Barry, from grad school from 100 years ago when I had a ponytail, believe it or not. Um, and I always, I always tell people, I say, I saw Barry you know, maybe 10 or 12 years ago at, a, at an ACS conference. I said, what are you doing these days? He goes, oh, well, I've been looking at, you know, things like salesforce.com and Workday or whatever was out then. And I'm going to I'm gonna build this system. And nobody was saying cloud then. We're going to host other people's data, provide a nice clean interface. It's going to be great. And I was working for a, a different company at the time. And I said, you're going to host other people's data? They're going to give you their data? I go, dude, that's crazy. That'll never work. So, you know, I work for Barry now because he was right and we were all wrong. Um, you know, so it, it, back then, yeah, you had CDD built its own infrastructure, built its own servers. Eventually, those became part of a co-location facilities. So, so then CDD hardware on, in co-location facilities. Um, CDD then began to have contracts with, for example, the NIH, which had very stringent, you know, FISMA compliance standards. So we have very high security um, and, uh, standards um, that are implemented. So lots of documentation. I could go into the details for you to death, but you know, security is extremely important uh, at CDD, and um, we implement security protocols through a variety of mechanisms and with our partners. We are still on those co-location providers today because of the auditing and security requirements around a number of our uh, long-term projects. Um, Gates Foundation, Spark, collaboration with Pew Trust, again, the NIH, all of these require you know, high level, high, high standards of security and implementation. We have uh, the plans and the capabilities to go to, for example, an AWS um, deployment, but at this point it's not necessary. And uh, our performance is such that, you know, it really hasn't been an issue. Um, so we have a plan to do that when the cost curve bends and, and it makes sense. But right now being independent works very well for us. And we're able to deploy, you know, there we have users in China, for example, and we don't have a problem with firewall issues or anything like that. So. Great. Thanks. Wonderful, wonderful. And again, if you are interested in connecting and learning more about CDD, um, you can reach out to Whitney via our meeting scheduler platform, or you can contact myself and my team directly. We can connect you with Whitney. Um, um, again, Whitney, thank you for your amazing overview. Um, and with that said, we'll take a quick five-minute break, folks. Uh, we'll regroup at 10.35 a.m. PST, uh, 1.35 EST for the next talk, which is Eric Martin. If you guys have a moment, I'll just share my screen now as well. Um, if you can just, um, if you see on the left-hand side, we have the lobby where you can message people over here and initiate a chat. Also, we have the lounge where you can sit down and talk to people based on any of your topic of your choice. And of course, we have our wonderful exhibitor boots that you can drop in anytime throughout the event, not necessarily the networking breaks. And um, yeah, with that said, we'll take a quick break now and we'll be back in about five minutes. Thank you.